Hello, good evening. Happy Saturday night. This is Vibin' with Ashley Live, and I'm your host, Ashley Live. This evening, we have a really special guest. His name is Sam Pace, and he's a singer, songwriter, and guitarist out of Austin, Texas. So we're gonna wait to bring him in the room, give you guys a performance, have a fun interview with him, and then open the floor to questions and answers. So we're just gonna hang tight because I started right at eight o'clock and um, just wanna make sure we welcome him, to, him into the room. Okay, I'm gonna check to see if I can add him to this live. Give me a second. Waiting, waiting. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. Waiting for Sam. Okay, I'm gonna tell him to join. Oh, there he is. Hi, Sam. Hey, Ashley, how you doing? I'm doing well. How's your evening going? It's going very nice. It's awesome. Very nice. Look at all the natural light you have on you. <laughs> Yeah, I got the sun coming in from over there, so. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. I'm like in a dark room with a ring light, so. <laughs> yeah, not always like this, but this time of day is pretty good. <clears throat> that's amazing. Well, I was just introducing you to the Vibin' with Ashley Live crew. I was telling them that you're a singer, songwriter, guitarist out of Austin, Texas. Is there, is there anything else that I missed <laughs> in that brief introduction? Well, that, that covers the generals for sure. Um, <laughs> There's a lot more to it, of course, but that that's uh, that's the gist. Yeah, I'm here in Austin cool. and I've been here for 10 years, so. Cool. So we're going to start with the interview and then we're going to go into the performance. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay, cool. So let's start from the beginning. So you're originally from Milwaukee. How young were you when you first got into music? Well, I started playing guitar when I was 15, so I was a little bit of a late starter. Um, although that's actually a pretty common age for people who kind of get into rock and roll, but, uh, but I was into music for pretty much my whole life. I mean, I was always listening with, with really intent ears when I uh, was young. Mm -hmm. So uh, back in that day, it was all about like what was on the radio. Like we had like three stations, right? Three, like oldie station, classic rock station, hard rock station. And then there was like a, you know, urban hip hop, hip hop slash 90s early 90s r&b station and it was pretty much going back and forth from those and kind of oldies when i was like under the age of like eight like eight or seven i was like liking a lot of oldies music like just that old classic rock and roll like little richard and um i mean all that stuff you know like twist and shout wild thing louis louis all that stuff i was really into and uh -huh. then um when I was in like sixth grade, so when I got to like 10, 11, 12, I went through like a pretty big hip hop stage. I was really into like Wu-Tang and Tupac and Biggie and those guys. Yeah. Then um, from there I got into big time classic rock. And then from classic rock, it was kind of into the blues and then into metal and like Metallica. And then high school, when I picked up the guitar at 15, I was really into blues and like Metallica and more classic rock and was pretty strong in that like Hendrix and that stuff and Zeppelin and then college I got into reggae a lot I was still <laughs> into all that other stuff and then I started listening to more reggae and jazz I, and when I do homework and shit in college I'd listen to a lot of jazz and so mm -hmm. but then um yeah I was I was always a good practicer from like 15 to 20 and then when I was 20 I started getting really 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 serious about it and practice times went up and then kind of took it from there mm -hmm. so would you say that there's a specific person or genre or song that inspired you to get into music well as much as as, as broad ranging and uh wide as my my influences are i have a lot of influences i can't actually narrow it down in most cases um mm -hmm. to specific things so the reason I picked up the guitar was pretty much because of Hendrix mm -hmm. and specifically Red House, which is his like blues standard. Um, for whatever reason, as much as I already loved music, 
that song and that artist uh, was pretty much the reason I decided to pick up the guitar. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really into Hendrix from like age 15 to 22. Like I mm -hmm. was just, that was right in the heyday of um, not only Napster, but all these other like free, you know, like bootleg sites where, so I was like in that prime age of like really falling in love with music and all these avenues of free illegal downloading Mark. going on. So I had a stack, I had, I had CD and it was still CDs days, you know, CDs. So I had at, at one time, and it says just how much Hendrix actually recorded because there's just studio stuff, but there's so much bootleg stuff and so much like foreign stuff where I had, I mean, I had like 70 or 80 Hendrix CDs from the studio stuff to live stuff to bootleg stuff. And so I was obsessed. And you were um, just on it. What's that? You were just schooling yourself on it. Just learning, yeah. listening and taking all of that in and interpreting it into your own music. Yeah. Yeah. I was obsessed. And, <laughs> uh, but, but then when you start going deeper with Hendrix and Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and all those guys, you, that's when I got into blues very shortly after. And, uh, Blues was like something that was always just waiting there for me. Like I, I remember when I was younger, just hearing the word blues and immediately getting some sort of shot of, wait, what is, what is that? What is that blues? Like I thought I, I had a feeling of what it was. And then when I started hearing like John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters, and I was really into Arl Burnside at the, in the early years. Um, but all those guys, Buddy Guy, Magic Sam, um, that was, then like it was, it was like it was I was I was good I was my I was totally into it and totally in love with it right away so amazing yeah so then in 2011 you moved to Austin what prompted your move to Austin Texas so I was in Chicago my first real I had a high school band that we just did a couple gigs with and we really didn't know what we were doing but it was still fun mm -hmm. and um then in college, I really didn't get anything together until I was like uh, my last or second to last year. And then I got into a serious band with a, with a few guys and um, we were in Madison, Wisconsin for two years. And then when we all graduated, we moved down to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Chicago was cool. We really liked it there. And then the, the band, after about two years in Chicago, the band started going in different directions creatively. And even though we were all, you know, having fun and working hard and, and whatnot. It was pretty clear uh, after about a year of like being pulled in different directions that the identity was just not getting stronger. It was getting more diluted. Right. So we, I, I kind of exited the band. It was me who kind of ended it, but um, you know, it was amicable and I'm still friendly with those guys, but it was, uh, it was, it was just a no brainer uh, really. Cause we were all going in different directions. And mm -hmm. then, um, at that point, I, I kind of decided I was going to move to Austin. And um, had you been previously to Austin? No, or? I'd never been to Austin, and and I and I wanted to get some ducks in a row before I moved. So I took a year and a half um, it, after breaking up with the band to really get ready for it. So I worked for eighteen months on a solo album and just worked coaching basketball with kids, and um, you know enjoyed my. I was close to home. I had friends in in Chicago and just kind of enjoyed myself, but worked hard in preparation. And then I moved to Austin in 2011 and it was all for music. It was strictly a music move. I didn't know anybody I'd never been. Mm -hmm. And um, it was all about that's, it was just tunnel vision, get to Austin and then get to work. That and was still in Austin. <laughs> yeah. I'm still here 10 years Austin. later. And I, and I really, you know, anybody who's in the, in the game of music is, you know, not going to be too, bullshit in terms of everyone's looking for at least a touch of that form and fate fame and fortune you know you want to make a lot of money doing it and you want to be you want people to respond to your music so of course that's always in the back of anyone's mind but um or in the forefront of their mind but but really i wanted to come to austin to really get my stage chops better than they ever were because i was playing gigs, gigs consistently but i knew i had a lot of work to do and so um I was able to get that in Austin. It took about two years to put the band together and get the album together and then kind of get the first, you know, 20 to 30 gigs in there. And then things start lining up if you keep at it. So, you know, after five, six, seven, eight years of 
of all that, plus the tours that came later, I was able to get, you know, I've gotten what I came here to get. And now it's, it's at another point where my family and I might be moving um, to Los Angeles, but that's all up in the air now with all the shit that's going on. So. Yeah. You just got to stay safe and hang tight and wait. Yeah. And yeah we're kind of, we're kind of, we, we already postponed once and now we're probably going to postpone again because you know, it's been six months of bad news. So we're going to, we're, we're going, my wife's an artist too. And we're, we're, we're you know, we kind of walk the, walk a tight rope in terms of, you know, we have, we have a kiddo as well. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's not the best time to go out there and throw caution to the wind. Um, so we're thinking about delaying a little bit longer. Of course. And there's no live music going on. So you would just be sitting in your house or your apartment out there just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and paying a lot more to do it. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Texas is, you know, Austin's not getting cheap too, but obviously LA is one of the big. Right, yeah, LA is. Expenses, yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so how would you describe the music that you typically create? I always say soul music. I mean, it, from a branding perspective, I say rock and roll or heavy soul. I mean, it's, it's rock and roll. It comes from the American black music, whatever you want to call it, canon, you know. It, it comes from blues. But, um, but, but I, but it's funny because when I was younger, I was like, so I was so, uh, you know, geared and branded and whatever with, with blues. And I was like, yeah, blues, I played blues and rock and roll. Blues. But then at a certain point I was like, well, you know, it's really, I don't even, I didn't even like the word blues rock. I was like, yeah, I just don't like that word. It's just the connotation is there's too much like cheesiness involved i think at, at certain points even though there's no better word to describe a lot of music than blues rock yeah. but then at a certain point i was like i didn't even like people calling it blues for whatever reason even though it's clearly blues based i mean there's no question about it. it's the heaviest influence i have mm -hmm. but um i just say soul music because it comes from that black uh you know that black american feel i mean it's a lot of blues but soul music i love you know uh, metallica's had a huge influence on me at black sabbath and even lots mm -hmm. of that especially sabbath comes from blues too but um yeah. i definitely have a taste for heavier stuff but also groove you know i'm really into the groove and there's a lot of groove in reggae and a lot of groove in funk and, and stuff like that so that's the best way i would describe it i think yeah it's a very eclectic mix of people that have influenced you over the years and it's I guess it's hard to really say like it's just one thing but it's cool to see I mean Metallica and then you know all the blues influence it's it's really cool to to hear your sound after that yeah the more the more I look back at myself and stuff I've created and and look at myself now it's it's really I'm really I, I can stepping outside myself like I'm really preoccupied with like groove you know what i mean like a good groove like I, I like to keep it simple most of the time but i i really love rhythm and and mixing up a rhythm like i might have a simple lick or something it's just like beyond simple but it's there's something different about it when you put it together with a band like it's way this is this is this is the simple stuff you know the simple heavy groove or whatever but there's something there's something different here and, and i hear that a lot and that's intentional and and so I'm, I'm really into rhythm and groove and pairing that with blues and soul music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your creative process like? When you write uh, so my creative process is I was fortunate to kind of get that squared away pretty early on in my creative period. So like, for whatever reason, everyone's got different skill sets. And like mm -hmm. I said, I was kind of a late starter, late bloom, late starter and a late bloomer. Um, but so I was like always for good till my late twenties, like insecure about my guitar playing and my singing, even though it was always improving and it was always pretty good. And then it got good and better. And now I'm at a point where I'm really happy and confident with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but for a long time, I wasn't as I was a little insecure about it. But the one thing I've never been insecure about is just my my songwriting. Not that I'm like a better songwriter than this person or I, I'm some genius songwriter, but I've always been able to get what I wanted across very clearly and effectively and mm -hmm. develop my own um, my own songs the way I want to hear them and deliver lyrics and everything in a package that 
is the way I want it to be. So I've always, I've never been insecure about my songwriting or my lyrics. I've always felt confident. This is me. This is what I'm trying to say. I'm not struggling to say it, um, even though you know it can take a long time to get the lyrics you want. But, right. but then the guitar stuff and the the vocals came along with just the 10,000 hours or whatever you want to call it. So anyway, getting back to your question, uh, the creative process for me has always been pretty simple. So what I like to do is get my, my chi uh, and my, my uh, skills as hot as they can get. So I'll practice the shit out of my electric guitar. I'll practice the shit out of my acoustic guitar. I'll read, I'll get in, I'll, I'll read, I'll have some form of reading that I'm doing consistently. I'll make sure I'm getting good exercise in, blah, blah, blah. And I'll make sure my facilities are at a really good spot. And then I will smoke a lot of weed. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the best writing comes through for me. It comes through at different times. Sometimes a song will just pop in you and it's there. But the times when I can write chunks of material that turn out good as far as I'm concerned is when I go deep inside that space. And that can take like a good week of like three to five hours a day for a week or two. And then sure enough, after like a week or two, if I'm consistent about it and I've, you know, I've stayed true to what I know I can bring out of myself, there'll just be a, like an explosion of like, you know, like four or five or six songs in, in a few days that'll be on the next album. You know what I mean? It's just a matter of kind of, getting deep within my own thing, pushing myself to my limits. And then just with, with, with the, with the marijuana, it just, whoop, it comes out, you know, it, it, you're, you're, you've, you've, you've heard lots of artists talk about, um, right. you know, you're a, a vessel or whatever, like you don't know where it comes from. So I like exploring that and it's just worked for me. So that's mm -hmm. what I use over the years. And I don't always have the, the time or space to get into those modes um, yeah. But it's a cyclical, you know, it's a cyclical thing. And then once the once the initial idea is done, right, you can bring it to the band, chip away at it, and then eventually finish it. Yeah, I love that it's like mind, body, and spirit. Like some people are just like, oh, I just write a song really quick, and then I do the little musical part behind it. But like, no, I want to be reading something. Like I want to be doing this. I want to be smoking. Like I want to like make sure I'm sleeping. Like people sometimes neglect the most obvious things, but like, that's so good that you're so disciplined to get in that space to, you know, create the music that you really ultimately want to put out there. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and I have moments where it's not as, is, you know, you know, it's right. not as puffed up as what I just explained. It's more, Oh, here's one song. But if, if I want to get into a space where I want a chunk of material, that's usually the most effective way to do it. Mm -hmm. So who would you most like to collaborate with? Who would I most like to collaborate with? Well, mm -hmm. um, most of the people I'd most like to collaborate with are dead. <laughs> um, well, okay, you can um, say because they're still amazing. What's that? Oh, you can still say people that you can, say, you can still say people. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's a ton of people I admire that are still alive. I would say I would love to play <laughs> with anybody like uh, uh, Jack White or um, you know, Jack White, I think anybody who digs the old blue stuff, and there's so many of us, especially in like Austin, you know, he has such a good uh, root structure. And I think I myself and most people who are in this city that play blues and rock and roll probably have good root structures too. And whenever right. you get to, to be around those people, it's just so much fun because you get to talk about, you know, what this artist meant to you. And you like, it takes you back to a 15 year old and you're like looking at the other 15 year old and you're like, yeah, man, I remember when I first heard that song or how much of that song or what that riff does to you or whatever. So anybody that's in that realm and, and we're going through this kind of new period of a lot of good soul music and a good, um, good blues and a good rock and roll is kind of a new renaissance of that going on. So any of those people, um, I would love to just hammer something out with or sit down and talk with. And, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my new podcast is all kinds of musicians. But when I get somebody who I know is in that same pair, that same realm as me, it's just so much fun to talk to them. But I mean, I would, any of the greats, man, I'm, I'm not picky. I would love to sit down with John Lee Hooker, mm -hmm. Hendrix. I mean, I don't know what you're going to do with Hendrix in the room. He's just going to make you feel so small. He's <laughs> apparently a really sweet, <laughs> unbelievable guy, but you yeah. know, there's a reason he didn't collaborate with, with too many people because he's just, he's a force into himself. I, but how could you even compare like Hendrix? It's just like. <laughs> even he, he, made, he even made Clapton basically cry and shiver in his boots before, you know, when he first found out about Hendrix, he was like, 
right. he's felt this small. But uh, yeah, any of the greats that are in that same, you know, blue that know the blues and know the rock and roll tree and, and can talk about the great drummers and the great bass players and the great guitar players. It's mm -hmm. just fun. So I'm, I'm not too picky within that realm. But pretty much anyone that's dead, you're like, dead. you're okay with. Oh, a lot of my heroes are dead. And in fact, my, one of my biggest heroes, Toots, uh, Hibbert of Toots and the Maytals, which is like my favorite, yes. uh, you know, not only reggae group, but, um, but, but just humans. And he just died like last weekend. And he, I was fortunate enough to, to meet him, which was an amazing experience. Very cool. And, um, what was he like? Yeah, I'm an old school guy. So all those guys, man, you know. Yeah. What was he like when you met him? Well, he was uh, <laughs> so sweet. I mean, so I got, I was, when I had that band in college, I was totally like, you know, I was just all over it and like, oh, let's see if we can open for these guys. Let's, let's send out emails to you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I was trying, I was really into Toots and the Made Tales and I, I contacted his management and his management is one of these, like at the time, probably up until his death was, you know, not one of these like CAA major, you know, talent organizations. It's some, I don't want to say some guy, but. I was Some just... guy down in Jamaica who was just like, you know, <laughs> but, but he was, I was like, oh, you should, you know, when you come through what it would have been, Madison or Chicago or the Midwest, you know, let us open for him, even though we weren't a reggae band. Yeah. And I was, and he's, he's like, oh, let me see what, what, ha what, what the everybody thinks or, uh, or what have you. And, and he's like, well, it's not going to work out, but here's six backstage passes. <laughs> So he gave us six backstage passes to, and I took me and my friends in, in, in the house of blues in Chicago and we went there and we went up before the show. And the first thing I see is I walk in, I turn to my left and there's toots, my big, what, really my biggest hero in life. Uh -huh. And he's, he's got his pants down at his ankles. <laughs> he's pulling his pants. <laughs> I'm like, Whoa, Whoa. And somebody else slammed the door on us. And then we're like, Oh, okay. We'll come back later. And as we're walking down the stairs, this guy's like, hey, man, you guys got any weed? We're like, uh, uh, kind of, yeah. Any, and, but, but anyway, we came back after the show. And um, most of the four of the six guys I was with were like, you know, we're going to go back there and we're going to try to get in there. Because there was like multiple rooms, right? It's like a multi-green area. And my, some of my other buddies were like, yeah, you know, that first experience was whatever. We'll, we'll meet you guys outside. All right. And so me and my buddy, Charlie, we, we go back there and we enter one room, look around, a bunch of people. We admire the whole band because we've seen them a bunch of times. So we're like, oh, it's the guitar player. Oh, it's the backup singer. Oh, all right. And, but Toots isn't there. So we go to the next room and it's even smaller and like even cooler people who are like, no Toots. Okay. And then we go into the last room and it's small, this small room. It's like a folding table. Yeah. Six, six other people around, around the table. One of them's Toots. And we're like, all right, we made it. And there's two chairs and we sit down. And we notice, I'm noticed he is like rolling a big blunt, you know, he's getting all this weed together. And so we take this weed out of our pocket and we throw it in the pile. Yeah. And then uh, we sit there for 20 minutes. He rolled it, we smoked it. And we would just, just talk with him. I mean, it was surreal. And it was also just a beautiful thing. He was just a beautiful. schoolgirls we, we kept it cool while we were with them and when we got outside it was not it was just that's a great story thank you for sharing very fortunate very lucky to have that you know a lot of people uh -huh. uh, get to play with their their idols i've never gotten to really play with any of my idols but just to sit down for that 20 minutes and do that was right pretty, pretty badass for me i loved it that's yeah. that's an incredible story i mean have you ever told that story before publicly i have yeah i've told you have okay, okay. yeah i have was really cool just because like you said he just passed what like two or three weeks ago like it was very recent. yeah I think it was last weekend or the weekend before or something yeah yeah wow so yeah. what are your favorite songs to perform hmm you know that changes um that really does change because as much as you might love a song or fans might love a song like it's funny because a lot of times fans will love a song and you're you're over it and they're asking for it and it's like yeah okay but you know any song that's got a good groove and heavy and you know the crowd is on board um and the energy is just good and it's e it's easy to play is good for a while and then there's something about it it just you know like anything else it's all relative and it gets old um and that happens to most songs 
the most fun time to play a song is really when it's like 75% done and you're playing it in front of people for the first time because there's just something about that experience. You know, it's like, you know, the song, your, your partner, your people on stage, know the song, you're ready to play it. And, um, but there's a vulnerability to it. And there's a, it's just like, especially if you play hundreds and hundreds of gigs, the old songs, there's not much to that. You know, what are you, what are you as a performer getting out of that? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. if the crowd is going bonkers and nuts, which happens, you know, to the big acts and sometimes the medium acts, and I've had that happen, but that's not, and that's a great feeling, but you're, lots of times when that happens, you're almost outside of yourself anyway. Like it's either second nature or you're just enjoying the crowd and like, but when you're really into a song, it's when like you're trying not to fuck it up right. because it's so <laughs> new. And uh, so that's, you know, that's a kind of long way of saying it changes all the time. I couldn't even say my favorite songs to play really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to applaud you because you've been so creative during this quarantine. You're doing a lot of live streams, doing a lot of covers. You did a memoir series. Every Tuesday you do a Tuesday tease. You said this earlier this month, you started a new podcast. It's called Waiting for the Encore. Which of these quarantine projects of yours is your favorite? Um, I, got, I, I like the podcast so far just because it's, uh, to, to be honest, it's not as much work, even mm -hmm. though I am curating or crafting in a way that I want it to be a nice presentation for people. Right. But um, the input versus output is a much higher ratio for the podcast because it you know like the memoirs i was lucky enough i wrote those when i was on tour last year. so most of that was written already but the actual recording of it mm -hmm. and, and it, for some reason it was difficult and uh a little stressful i was mm -hmm. really getting pissed at myself a lot um and i like the way those came out and i'm gonna do some more of those uh, but i wouldn't call it fun you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like it's work and i think it's good work to do the podcast is really fun, man. Like I, I, I guess started getting into podcasts pretty recently, like two, three years ago. And it's such a good thing on the road, you know, yeah. when you're on the road a lot. Um, for years, you just music is good enough. But but when you're on the road for hours and hours and hours, uh, music loses its it loses you, when you're on the road that long, you want something to take yourself outside of yourself. You know what I mean? You want to be outside of the fact that you're on the road again, mm -hmm. driving for six more hours again. Yeah. And so as soon as I got turned on to, you know, conversational podcasts, it, it was like a revelation for the mm -hmm. road because it's, you're totally outside of yourself. It's, it's an enjoyable, you learn things, yeah. you, you stimulate your brain in ways you haven't stimulated it. So after absorbing those for a couple of years, like, and the, the, what you would call it, the Corona lockdown, Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to start doing that with musicians. And it's, it's not that, it, you know, it's, it's good to sit and talk to different people you would never talk to or right. not, not extensively. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that has been pretty cool. I'm looking yeah. forward to doing a lot more of it too. Yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to it too. Cause it's, it's very similar, like our yeah. podcast form, but I'm doing it live, but mm -hmm. I really love that, that you have this podcast and you're having these really amazing conversations because mm -hmm. when it Musician speaks to another musician there's just an energy that you get there yeah for sure <laughs> that's why i love it <laughs> yeah so you've toured all over the country what are a few of your favorite music venues well it's funny that you said because it's kind of the same situation with uh with the songs like there was a time a few years ago where i would rattle off a few that were like oh, i love this place and i always will love them but then when you go back yeah a sixth seventh time eighth time it's like uh you know, okay, not quite the, because uh, the bar is already so high, there's nowhere to go over down. Exactly. But, uh, so there's a few places. There's there's a famous bar in, in Washington, D.C. called Madam's Organ, mm -hmm. which is a, a famous blues bar, and it's it's like a five-story place. It's really cleverly and just, it's a cool thing. And, and you play there, and you make good money, and it's so loud, and you get free food and free drinks all night. It's a freaking packed street i mean it's that's a great place madam's oregon and there's a place in um, jerome arizona which if everyone's been to arizona it's a jerome it's it's an old mining mountain town that's now like a tourist town it's like for years it was like a hippie mountain thing interesting and now yeah it's an amazing it's it's you know we started playing there 
seven, eight years ago. And we always do like two, maybe three gigs every time we go. And that's just, uh, that place has a nice weirdness to it and a nice, people are into it. They really appreciate it. You make a lot, you make good money and you just play your butt off for people who love it in kind mm -hmm. of a weird setting, beautiful setting. Yeah. That, that place is fantastic. Um, I, I just love playing in California. That's part of the, you know, obviously we were kind of moving out there. It's just, I, I just love California. Um, There's a place in Evergreen, Colorado called the Little Bear Saloon, which is a really cool spot in the mountains. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be forgetting any of my... There's a, there's a number of spots that have been... It's always fun playing home shows in Chicago or Milwaukee and stuff like that, too. So. What about Austin, the music venues in Austin? Yeah, I mean, so, geez, it's been six months since I played a gig anywhere. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I always liked playing the Black Heart. Uh, before it closed down I mean it was really fun playing the Continental Club and it was fun playing Antones mm -hmm. and uh, Scoot In I mean those places are just just fun places to play um, places we played like a lot I, I the Black Heart always had a nice a nice feel to it it was a good spot and that place closed down and, I mean it's fun it's fun playing those other spots yeah. as well you named a lot of great venues. Most of them I've never been to, but I definitely am always looking for venues to go to when I go to different cities. So mm -hmm. I was in Austin for South by Southwest, but I didn't go to any music venues. So I I have a couple of those on my list, but I'm like, I'm always asking people like, what are the good music spots around here? So so thank you for shedding some light on that. So yeah, hopefully we'll be able to survive. It's not looking <laughs> that great really. I miss live music so much. Yeah. How do you think the pandemic will change live music? Well, it's funny because I've been asking that question a lot on my podcast. <laughs> um, well, it's going to be, you know, it's so, it's so funny. I have not even thought to answer that question while other people have been answering it for me. Right. Um, I mean, it's going to be a lot different. I mean, there's going to be a lot less venues we'll see how many, how it affects the actual artists themselves. Are some of them just going to drop out of the, the game? But of course, younger people will always be coming up. But um, I don't know, man, when you're a musician, you're a musician. I think people are going to be forced into day jobs. I mean, lots of us have day jobs. I've had day jobs. I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a real full-time kind of 40 hour thing. Uh, and, and music's a nightlife anyway, so you can still do that. Um, but it's going to be tough, man. I mean, there's going to be less venues, probably not as many less musicians, meaning more people fighting for the same pie. You just have to be clever, man. You have to just adapt with, I mean, you just have to find a way to make it work, whatever that is for you. I've, you know, invested my time over the last six months in online stuff and YouTube stuff and, and all that. And, and I just think that's something that's not going to go away in, in the immediate future. So it's worth investing time in that. I would think a lot of people are going to be in the same boat. Um, I don't know. I think it'll just take time. But for the people who want to see live music, which is plenty of people, the people who yeah. want to play music, which is plenty of people, can, you know, find the middle people who facilitate this. Uh, right. Those people to either get their finances in order or new people to come in and take that void or whatever. And that's tough to say how long it'll take. It, you know, it'll be different for a few years, maybe never back to the same or maybe completely different. That sure. makes me sad. I mean, but there's always going to be people that want to see it and there's always going to be people that want to play it. So all it takes is those middle people and those middle people have always been there. So <laughs> it, it'll come back. It'll come mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Hopefully soon. <laughs> so what artists or genres of music have you been listening to in 2020? I always go back to old reggae. Um, you know, it's funny because most of the music I listen, I listen to I do is with my daughter now, just in, in the, the common space of the house. Um, what have I listened to a lot this year? Obviously, there's, there's a few new bands that I like. The Black Pumas are really good. Um, there's a book. A uh, book. There's a band called Rain Wolf, which is, uh, have you heard of Rain Wolf? Not. They're, they're just really, they're, they're like that, you know, new form beast of uh, garage blues rock. 
You know what I mean? Where it's like, it's a little bit like the white stripes, a little bit like the black keys, but it's its own thing. And the lead guy is, he's a, he's a really good singer and, and a good song crafter of heavy bluesy, soulful stuff. They're pretty cool. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in, in Austin for like, peers. And I always like seeing friends of mine and peers put music out. Um, but I always revisit, revisit the old stuff too. Um, like I just, like when you listen to something with your daughter or, or your, you know, a young person who hasn't heard it, it's kind of like listening to it for the first time, right? Right. Uh, but you know more than they know about it. So it, it rejuvenates the music. So we revisit, revisit old reggae and I'll throw James Brown on and, and you know, and she, she digs all of it. So yeah, I don't know, other than like, you know, Black Pumas and Green Wolf and there's probably a few others in there. I, I just like when, when something comes out of the past that I haven't heard, cause I've been so exploratory in my years that mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I've heard so much that when something else comes out from the, yeah the past that I haven't heard, I, I love that. Oh yeah. That's it's like, Oh, this came out in 1992, but then all of a sudden you had just rediscovered it. And it's right. wow. That's so cool. Well, yeah. The, yeah. yeah that's something you already really love like a deep cut, you know, whether it's yeah. from Toots and the Maytels or the Rolling Stones or whatever, and you haven't heard it and you it, you like it, that's an amazing thing. It doesn't happen that often either, too. So. Oh, completely. Some of the B-side stuff is better than the stuff oh. on the radio or was on the radio or was single. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you could change anything about the music industry, what would it be? I could change anything about the music industry. Hmm. That's tough because I've kind of passed through, you know, that common stage of whatever you want to call it, cynicism or bitterness or whatever. Like I was never that bitter or cynical, but you, you know, anybody who's in the entertainment game, yeah. you know, you have to deal with being, you know, frustrated and, and you, you know, you deal with all that, whether it's, you know, envy or, 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 you know, all that stuff. And, and everyone feels that it might not be, outwardly spoken or outward, but you just, it's part of the game, you know? So I feel like I kind of passed through that stage a few years ago into a, into a pretty just happy place of like, you know, cliches of whatever you want to, you know, just focus on yourself and focus on what you can control and get better at everything you're doing all the time and good things will happen. Right. So I don't think too much about like, I wish it wasn't this way or I probably did when I was younger, you know? Right. But now it's just like, do your best work and don't complain. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, have a, I have a lot to be thankful for. And I don't want to sit and be like, I wish it wasn't like this or whatever. There probably is something I would change about it. Um, but I don't know, man. I just take the good with the bad and right. keep on rocking. You know? It's good to have a positive mind frame, though, and just be yeah. like, it's cool it is what it is like i'm just gonna keep doing my thing and yeah. everything else around me is just noise yeah yeah, yeah sure. completely agree with that so what song do you wish that you wrote well when you asked earlier what songs do i like to perform i thought you were gonna ask what are my favorite songs of all time and, and i've had so many oh, you, could you could tell us that i'm into that yeah I, I would probably just go towards you know there's, there's probably a hundred songs i wish i wrote yeah. Um, but the songs that I kind of, for whatever reason, kind of put aside as, uh, well, these are really special are uh, Voodoo Child, Slight Return by Hendrix. Mm -hmm. um, I just, that that song has just always been one of the, the coolest fucking songs. Uh, House of the Rising Sun. I like that song as a very young kid. And I, it's just one of the most stone cold striking songs uh, it's such a badass fucking song and um sitting on the dock of the bay i mean it's just one of the best songs of all time Definitely. i mean that song is just I, everybody feels that fucking song you know what i mean it's just it's such a good song of course um, those three have always been kind of like you know i'm just gonna set those aside as kind of the great songs of my and and they've kind of lost their feel for the most part because you know i've heard it for 25 years but i'd be happy if i wrote any one of those songs <laughs> There's so many to choose, right? There's so many. There's so many. <laughs> Peter Tosh and Nina Simone are two of your biggest heroes. What other musicians do you admire? 
Um, so Toots from Toots and the Mantels is huge. Jimi Hendrix is huge. Peter Green is huge. Peter Green is my favorite, um, for lack of a better term, my favorite bluesman. Um, he's just, the, his tone of his guitar and his singing, I, I just am enchanted by and totally inspired by. And he's, Toots, Hendrix, and Peter Green are the three biggest influences of my life musically. Um, I love, and Nina Simone, people like Nina Simone and Peter Tosh are on that very one B list, second tier. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot. I love John Lee Hooker. I love the Rolling Stones. I love Tom Waits. I love, um, I mean, I love Zeppelin. I don't really listen to Zeppelin much anymore, but the influence they had at an early age, I love Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, Metallica, I went through a huge stage with them. I, I, I really take the time to uh, adore my heroes. You know, I like, I'm, I'm outwardly, um, I'm pretty forward about how much I love the people I love. I, I'm so grateful for them that I talk about them with a lot of adoration. Um, and there's a lot of them. I'm probably forgetting a few. I love Bob Marley. I mean, I fucking love Bob Marley. Definitely. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. Oh. I have a lot of heroes. Yeah. <laughs> so many. <laughs> yeah. What's the best advice that you've ever been given? Oh, God. Like directly or um, honestly, I don't know if I could pull a best advice. I, the, whether you want to call it advice or just things to live by, you know, yeah. it just, uh, when I was a young adult, it always just made the most sense. And I've pretty much always stuck to it of, you know, know thyself and to thy own self be true. It's just the simplest, but most, you know, it's the most straightforward truth you can, you can pursue is just know who you are and be true to yourself. There's everything else falls under that. You know what I mean? And those are, you know, I, I believe I'm pretty sure they're both Shakespeare or whatever, but I mean, that's, that's it. Know who you are and, and be true to yourself. Oh, okay. I love yeah. that true to yourself because no one is like, you're the best version of yourself. You can't try to be that other person. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. So what advice would you give to other musicians during this quarantine? Uh, think outside the box, keep working your fucking craft as hard as you can take the time. You know, most people I'm talking to is they're making good use of their time, whether it's writing new music or exploring new things they haven't had time to, mm -hmm. or um, I hear the word, uh, what's the word I hear a lot? Not breather, but um, pause button, not pause button. Anyway, there's a word I hear a lot of, of my peers use that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's something in the realm of taking a breath or, or, or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, just think outside the box. You got it. If you want to stay in the game, think outside the box. Think of some new avenues. Um, push yourself. Um, be good to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Treat your, treat your body and your mind right and be healthy and stay, stay tough. Get tough. It's going to get tougher. I mean, I'm not just, I don't think that's just a thing for music people. I think that's for everybody. I yeah. Everybody's got to get tough. And I think, um, you know, we're in a stage of society where we've been so blessed with peaceful, uh, with a long lasting peace for the most part as a society. And, you know, we're all pretty coddled, which is good. Right. Because we've, we're fortunate to be in that state, but it, you know, when you get to that comfort, you get, you start getting a little soft. So it might start getting tougher. We got to toughen up. Yeah. yeah. Be ready for some. Yeah. Yeah. Put your big boy hands on and just get ready because it's coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> totally. Um, so this is the time where you're going to plug everything, your website, your YouTube, just everything that you're doing right now, plug it. And then we're going to get into your performance. Cool. Yeah. So you can visit me at sampacemusic.com exactly like you think it would be spelled S-A-M-P-A-C-E music.com and all my YouTube and Spotify and uh, Facebook and Instagram, you can access from there. And most of the, you know, after backslashes on those are like a Sam Pace music. The band is Sam Pace and the Gilded Grit. Um, go to Spotify, follow, go to YouTube and subscribe because I'm really investing in those platforms a lot. Um, and yeah, we got a lot of cool music coming out. New single on October 15th, which is a funky one. And, 
a lot of stuff coming down the pike. So. Awesome. If you, if you don't follow Sam already, follow him on all those platforms and Sam, take it away. This is your time to shine. Sure. So I'll do a couple songs and I'll do one by two, two, two just passed because I, oh. well, it took me a long time to learn. I mean, I knew some of his songs, but for whatever reason, I didn't teach myself a lot of his songs. And then as soon as he died, I was like, wait a minute, let me dig into those. And it just, it felt so good. So. <laughs> I go to bed, but sleep won't come. Wake up in the night, and I couldn't fight the feeling. Mm -mm -mm. Early in the morning. Just the same situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've got 400 months rent to pay. And I can't find a job. Mm -mm -mm. Let me tell you, time to time to everything is going hot and so long, so long, so long, so long. Time bomb, time bomb, everything's going higher and higher, 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 higher and higher. Good times we live in the bad times. Bad times ain't over. Oh, yeah. When I was a little boy, ooh, just keep on feeling it, feeling it. Good God. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, time to time to everything is going hot and so on, so on, so on, so on. Time to singing if my ray charles is a huge i, I adore ray charles yes I just that in the middle of the song <laughs> so. <laughs> it's okay <laughs> so guys if you have any questions for sam put them down in the chat and we'll get to them after he's done performing cool the and i'll do another one and this is a, a new one of mine which i'm still figuring out how i want to record it uh -huh. but uh uh it's pretty much finished <laughs> Get lost where I need to go. What I've got to show. I get lost in the endless sky, flying so high. I hope you will understand me when I tell you that I'm no bigger man. But if you can't understand me, babe, I will get along. I get along. I'm into 
Sam, that was awesome. So we actually have a couple questions that I want sure. to share with you. Do you think places you live like Chicago influence your writing of songs? I would say not directly, but indirectly. Mm -hmm. I can't say really how, but I'm sure they do. I mean, like when I moved down here, um, it didn't take long for me to get a sound that came out. Um, a number of songs came out. All of a sudden, there was like this Texas sound to it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that yep. was not intentional. It just came through. So um, it definitely has an effect, but it's tough for me for me to say how or in what way or whatever. It just kind of comes into your system and then it comes out. Right. Is there any hidden meaning in your music? <sighs> um, well, like a specific level or, or a grand? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I like to put lyrics that and not every you know it's not 100% of the time but I like lyrics that are 78% 70, of the time lyrics that mean something mm -hmm. and people can understand clearly what they mean and yet they can mean something there's different ways to look at it it's kind of right. what what you what that means to you as a listener because there's this thing where like if you're an artist you create it and you put it out and then it's not yours anymore mm -hmm. it's everybody's so um, I kind of like playing into that notion. That's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. What kind of guitar do you prefer to play on? Well, I don't have much uh, choice in the matter because I have one ac acoustic and one electric, and it's been that way for 15 years, which I think is pretty crazy considering how much I play. But it's just the way it's worked out, and it's um, I, I haven't wanted for much for whatever reason. I just love my Martin acoustic guitar and my uh, Gibson SG. And those are my babies. Amazing. So pretty simple <laughs> answer on that one. Very simple. What yeah. is your favorite part about this line of work and your least favorite? Um, hmm. I mean, the least, fit, the least fun part is when you have a show that, you know, there's three things to a show. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much do you make? How much does the crowd enjoy it and how good do you sound? Mm -hmm. And there's two things within how good you sound because the crowd's hearing something different than what you're hearing on stage. So if you're on stage and it, the sound is great to you and you're playing well, that's something you're going to have fun. You're like, Ooh, this sounds good. Yeah. If you're getting paid real good, that's always something, you know, if you're doing a gig and you're doing a job and you're getting paid for it and it's like, all right, this is, oh, we're doing this gig. It's an okay gig or it's a shit gig, but I'm getting paid for it pretty good. So I'm, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's where the crowd's loving it. And that's just the best thing possible. You know I mean? That's when you're having, well, sometimes that can even backfire because sometimes the crowd's annoying. You know, if it's a bunch of drunk people who don't care about you or the music, they just care about getting crazy. That can be fun. can also be a pain in the ass. Right. So those are the three you're working with. If you have all three, you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. You sound great. You're getting paid and the crowd loves it. Your money. Take away one. You're still doing pretty good. You're still doing pretty good. And then if you only have one, 
you're kind of fu- you know then it's you're 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 teetering on this is not really what do we do you know this sucks and then yeah. if you have zero of them which happens once in a while it's just not fun you know mm-hmm. it's not fun it's not work because you're not it's it's just a pain in the ass so i would say that's what i nobody likes to have a shit crowd with a shit sound and no right. pay so you try to eliminate that at every turn definitely but you can't always like you don't never really know the crowd that you're walking into it's no. always a surprise right right it is mm-hmm. and um uh, that's why the great crowds, those shows always, even if it's a small place, you know, musicians love that. Mm-hmm. If, the, if the energy is bouncing around inside a small venue, uh, you don't need a big venue because the feeling is intense in that small space that just bounces off the walls. So uh, the opposite of that is just, it's not fun. It's lame. I don't like, you know, that's, that's the answer I guess to that. Mm-hmm. Do you think smoking pot makes you more musically creative? Yes, I do. For mm-hmm. sure. No question about it. It, it, it totally changes the way you hear music. Um, it changes the way, and when I say you, I mean me. And I think a lot of my contemporaries, almost every single person I really dig, um, I, I think in most cases, copious amounts of marijuana were spoken. I mean, I, I've heard that about the Beatles. It's obvious with anybody in, in the reggae field. I mean, those people smoke gargantuan amounts. Uh-huh. Um, I think Metallica would be the would be the, a lot of the metal people. It's more of a speed thing, mm-hmm. um, but uh, definitely there's something about it. It's uh, it's a magical thing for for me, and I think a lot of people in music for sure. Mm-hmm. Do you ever have performance anxiety? Um, meaning, I guess it's somebody else's question, so I'll just try to answer the best I can. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that means like stage fright or like just butterflies does that mean like butterflies maybe um <laughs> yeah maybe a little sometimes i mean i'm always i'm at a point now where i you know I, I i like to practice and i like to if there's a big gig coming up or a tour coming up like i like the process of getting ready for that so i will prepare properly so that eliminates anxiety anxiety can come in different forms with performance i think it, for me it's more about like I don't know. Sometimes I get anxiety about like a, a stupid stuff like, oh, the load in at that show is going to be a pain in the ass. Or mm-hmm. uh, we don't know how much money we're going to make because it depends on this or this. So it's, I think it's some of my anxiety comes on the business end of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's all that we have time for this evening. But Sam, this was an awesome conversation. Very eye-opening, very inspiring, very creative. And like I said earlier, I love all the creative things that you're doing. You're doing you know, your podcast, you're doing covers, you're doing live streams, like you are really utilizing this whole quarantine and just really making it your own creatively. And I think a lot of musicians need to take, you know, lessons from from what you're doing, because you're really capitalizing on it. Thank you. I I appreciate you having me on here. It's been fun. And yeah, I'm just, uh, I got to put my energy somewhere. So it's really just a, yes, I have to do it. Otherwise, I'll probably Hey, I love it. You have to keep doing it. I mean, it's your calling. It's your passion. So you you definitely have to keep doing that. So Sam, I just want to thank you so much for joining me this evening. It was a great conversation. Please, if you don't already follow Sam, follow me. I do Vibing with Ashley live all the time. And I interview great musicians like Sam. So Sam, thank you so much again. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and look forward to seeing your next endeavors. Absolutely. Good luck, Ashley, with this whole thing. And and maybe we'll do it down the line again. And thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. Have a good night, guys. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.